Jail sucks. So, you may be wondering why I look like this. Short story short, I broke out of jail. It's because they wouldn't let me play on my Switch. What the hell did they expect? A responsible citizen? It was pretty boring to be honest. I not only had to be there for one day, but there's a lot I could miss. Like Diet Coke. And Unicorn Overlord. To me, Vanillaware has quickly become one of the best developers out there and I've barely touched their legacy. In January, I played the masterpiece 13 Sentinels Aegis Frame that quickly became one of my favorite games of all time. And in February, I started Odin Sphere Lethrasir. Guess how many times it took me to say that? One actually. While I haven't finished Odin Sphere, I really enjoyed my time with it thanks to its gameplay that was really, really good even if it had too many features for its own good. And that's the thing with Vanillaware. They excel in the gameplay department in their games. Even 13 Sentinels, which took a more story-focused approach, had some pretty good gameplay where the only issue was that it interrupted a fantastic story. Alongside amazing gameplay, Vanillaware also doesn't stick to one genre at all. They do something completely different with every release. One second, they make an action RPG, the other a beat em up, and the other being an anime lifestyle game. We all have our ups and downs. While I adore 13 Sentinels so much for everything that I've already mentioned, I don't think I could ever make a video on it, just because of how it's set up and how non-linear its approach to storytelling is, but I think I would probably fuck something up. It still is a fantastic game and I highly recommend you play it immediately. If I said any more, I'd be spoiling a masterpiece and I could never forgive myself if I did that. Unicorn Overlord, on the other hand, is perfect for a video like this. It's a phenomenal game, just like 13 Sentinels, but you're going to be enjoying Unicorn Overlord for the exact opposite reason you love 13 Sentinels. This is a game focused entirely on the gameplay. One of the biggest strengths of Unicorn Overlord is something that I didn't expect at all, and that's how it utilized tropes in amazing ways. A lot of the time when you see a game, anime, or movie use tropes, it can feel bland, uninspiring, lazy, or just flat out boring. But somehow, Vanillaware did the opposite and used a lot of tropes and pre-existing ideas to fine-tune Unicorn Overlord into something amazing. I'd argue that all the tropes and elements from other games make Unicorn Overlord a better game. It's certainly not trying to do something it can't do, and instead focuses on making an amazing experience that excels in so many other places. If you've played the game or even the demo, you can obviously see the passion Vanillaware has for Unicorn Overlord. Not every developer would willingly spend 10 years on this, but of course, Vanillaware would. I think the most obvious trope here is what the premise is all about. There's this evil dude that takes over the continent, a parent dies, the prince survives, and it's up to them to build an army. And the protagonist has blue fucking hair. What's next? Does the dude have a childhood best friend that becomes a love interest? This game is amazing, you get to marry people, which includes your cousin. That's weird. It feels weird saying all this praise, but I generally love how they utilize tropes here. It's like Fire Emblem, but instead of using tropes of its franchise, Unicorn Overlord uses a lot of different tropes from a lot of different games, and it's pretty good. Zenora, while a generic antagonistic force, it gets the job done, and so does everything else. The characters, the story, just everything other than the game. It's not to say that any of what I just said are bad or lazy, because they're not, but they just get the job done, and that's okay. If there's one thing I have to say about Unicorn Overlord, it's that there's so much to do here and it's fucking amazing. It's a great refresh for fans of strategy RPGs because of how much goes into every battle, down to a character's position in a unit. Though because of that, I'd imagine that this could be quite overwhelming for newcomers of the genre, or casual fans of the genre. There's an incredible amount of things to do here, from fighting to fighting bridges to a fucking mining minigame? It does sound overwhelming, and to a point... It is, but its complexity makes it one of the best strategy RPGs, no, one of the best games I've played this year. It's all thanks to the tutorials, which aren't Xenoblade like 2 style, since they actually help you settle into the game and feel very natural. It helps that there's tons of passion here from the developers, and it's like I mentioned before with the tropes. It's not like Vanillaware took elements from other games into the genre lazily. They took it with love and put their own twist onto it. They've put so much effort into this game and, to be honest, they put too much fucking effort in here. I mean, look at the NPCs, they look too fucking good. A huge surprise to me was that Unicorn Overlord presents an open world. That's right, an open world for a strategy RPG. That's simply insane. While world maps have been a staple in the Fire Emblem series, you never actually really get to explore the world. You just get from one point to another and select a map. But here, it makes perfect sense and it makes the gameplay feel a lot better. Maps that we fight on actually feel like they're part of a real world. Outside of the actual combat, I love the gameplay in the overworld world too. It just feels satisfying traveling around the world and rebuilding towns from the ground up. If it was just that, I would still like the overworld, but less so. Thankfully, there's other things to do here, like item pickups, stone 
circles, carvings, and a lot more that I haven't mentioned. While I do wish there was more variety here and there with liberating towns, it's really hard to complain here since this is vanillaware. They can make a gacha that actively scams me, and I'd still love it because of how much passion there is. In Unicorn Overlord, there are five countries, each unique in their own way. You start out in Cornea, the central country, and the one Elaine is from. To the east is Drakenhold, which feels quite similar to Cornea. Huge fucking desert site, but that makes sense when you dig deeper into the lore. Just south of Cornea is Elheim, which is home to the most beautiful characters you'll ever see in a video game. I mean, look at them. Up north is Bastorius, which is inhabited by a race known as Bestrals. Bestrals aren't your typical humans with furry ears or tails. They're just fucking animals with human legs, and it scares me. Finally, there's Albion, not that one, which is inhabited by angels. They are racist, for some reason. Don't know why, but they are. Overall, I really do adore Feverith. The developers at Vanillaware could have gone the much simpler route of just going with a basic world map, but no, they put a shit ton of effort into here, and that helped to make Unicorn Overlord feel like a proper adventure. And hey, if you're feeling suicidal, you can always tackle the final boss, Breath of the Wild style. I wouldn't recommend that, but some of us have death wishes, and I respect that. The only downside is that I feel like the countless towns and the countless settlements blend together to me after a while, with every liberation quest feeling the same. If Vanillaware ever makes DLC, a sequel, or whatever, However, I'd like to see more unique settlements like farms or even a school. The combat takes a mix of several different games, with the main one being units and the real-time gameplay from Ogre Battle, which I didn't realize until it was pointed out to me. You see, Ogre Battle is essentially an RTS mixed with a strategy RPG, where instead of fighting solo, characters would fight together in units, which is an incredible idea, and I'm honestly shocked it hasn't been used more in strategy RPGs. Back to the actual gameplay itself, I'll start with units as that's probably the most important part about combat. In a unit, you can have up to 5 characters, though you start with 2 and need to upgrade by getting honor. You get honor through battles, finishing deliveries in town, or through rapport. It doesn't take that long to upgrade units though. I was so disappointed you couldn't upgrade to 6 characters. This is bullshit. I mean, it would have already turned an already broken game into something that's more broken, but hey, at least give me an option. Arranging a unit to optimize a character's potential is almost half of the fun in combat, and you need to find the perfect synergy so your units don't melt apart. Like Elaine, for example. He's quite strong and has a good defense, but that doesn't really matter if there's a witch or a shaman. Then comes Scarlet, a priest who's a really good healer. Add in another unit like Hodrick. He can defend allies from oncoming attacks. And there, you have a really good unit that gets fried for a while. You unlock up to 10 units and there are a ton of characters that you can recruit, both in story and in regular gameplay. Trying to figure out the best unit combination does take a while, but when you find the perfect unit, nothing can take it down, and it's amazing. It's like taking the perfect shit. My strongest scene had Elaine, Scarlet, Berengaria, Virginia, and Gilbert, who I then swapped out with Mommy in the final battle. Unlike something like Soul Nomads, which feels like a poor man's unicorn overlord, this isn't turn-based and instead real-time like I've mentioned before. There aren't grids, which helps make combat feel a lot more natural. Within units, there's a leader. Each leader has their own effect, with the effect being shared by a few classes. One might be that you can fly and thus ignore terrain. Another one lets you assist other units in combat, with it either being magic, healing, or arrows. And another one being you rest faster. Oh, how I wish I could sleep faster. Heading back to assist, they're quite useful and can turn the tide of battle. Or, they can fuck everything up in a split second. Also, since characters are all in a unit, you don't directly control them other than moving them around. Characters in Unicorn Overlord have action points and passive points, which go off in battle. Active points are moves that activate and target an enemy, while passive points usually activate before an enemy or a friend attacks, and helps out quite a bit. At the beginning, battles are quite quick, since every unit only has one or two active and passive battles quickly take forever when you promote your classes, or have accessories that increase AP or PP. The animations are nice, but Jesus Christ, I quickly sped up combat, which is a godsend. And if that already sounded like a lot, then I'm sorry, because there's even more. The final part to combat is Valor Points, which are used for a variety of things. The first thing is that they control how many units you can send into battle, with you getting 3 or 4 depending on the type of battle. And if everybody in a unit perishes, the bar goes back to zero. The secondary focus with Valor Points, and the more fun aspect to them, is by using a certain amount, you can use a special ability, which like before, changes with the class. You can choose to deal damage, increase EXP, teleport, or steal money. Times are rough, okay? If there's one thing I had to complain about the combat, it's that... This game makes no fucking sense and perfect sense at the same time, it's so fucking weird. One second I'm winning and the other I'm not because of seemingly stupid shit. It's like, damn man, I understand, but at the same time, I don't. Heads up, this part of the gameplay review has spoilers for the last map, so skip ahead if you don't want spoilers. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
With the final map in the game aptly named Unicorn Overlord, this is the greatest challenge so far. Maps so far were huge, but this takes it up to another level. First step here is to take out all the Dark Marquesses, which takes quite a bit of time. What comes after is pretty damn cool. Grand Kareen opens up. You can either fight Galerius head on, or take out the minions around, which I recommend. Doing that gives you plenty of room to fight them. Turns out taking your time and actually putting the effort to get ready to fight a final boss is worth it. Interesting. Galerius is a beast. If you thought fighting Galerius was tough the first time, you're in for a fucking ride. He's pimped out to the max and hits extremely hard. He has a thousand HP and deals an insane amount of damage and he restores HP after every turn. And I didn't even mention, he's already in a sigil. I only beat him thanks to everything I did beforehand, like maxing the Ring of the Unicorn, Ring of the Maiden, and mostly maxing out AP and PP for my entire unit. It's an insanely satisfying final boss and it's crazy. Maybe it's recency bias, but it's one of my favorite bosses in the entire strategy RPGs tied with triangle strategy. I went in expecting a standard final boss, and I came out tired and exhausted because it was 4 a.m. in the morning when I woke up and I was exhausted. Like in any strategy RPG, you get a shit ton of characters. While all are completely unique, with quite a few sharing classes with others, it's not an issue. It's because these characters are incredibly customizable, and man, it's amazing. You could be boring and just add accessories that will strengthen a unit, or you could be exciting and completely overload a unit to the point of them being black holes. There are over 60 classes here, which is crazy and a lot to pick from. If you have the right accessories, you can turn strong units into crazy strong units, or make sure they don't get poisoned. Some of the accessories I went for were the ones that increased critical rate, action points, and passive points. The last two in particular are really good, since that ensures your character has a lot to pick from. It goes a long way too, since promoted classes get one new AP and PP, and if you have the right accessories, you can get up to 4 action and passive points, which makes sure your units bleed through enemies. It's crazy. And what if I told you that wasn't it? What if I told you you can make these characters into fucking demons? Another point to combat that I haven't mentioned before are tactics. They tell you what you need to do in combat and what to prioritize. You can get incredibly in depth too. You can choose if a cleric heals another unit if a unit has 75%, 50%, or 25% HP, or if it's fucking light outside. You can save and load tactics too, so you can either copy and paste the same strategy to every unit with the same class, or you can vary it up, which is a great idea, given that not every situation is going to be the same. Plus, if you're not happy with one of your units for whatever reason, you can get the idealist hand mirror which lets you change a unit's stat growth pattern and their appearance it's honestly not a lot but i think it's pretty good it helps to make one of your unique units actually look unique i'm totally not talking about yana who i still love and adore okay so this is the unicorn overlord special edition or the special monarch edition comes in a big big box like super fucking big. But if you take the uh, cover off, which just give me a second, I have to do this one hand. Uh, I'll just focus my dog for a second. Yeah, he's uh, okay. You're gonna just do that on video, okay? Oh, okay. Never mind. You have a conscious. Oh, sorry, Sparks. What's up, buddy? Uh, my sheets are getting washed right now, so give me a sec. That's why my bed's so messy right now. But it comes in a uh, box like this, bottom of the box, all that, and you open up the box and you get your uh, copy of the game right here. Basic, basic stuff, right? And then you get the 16-bit uh, arranged uh, soundtrack, which I gotta open up again just to figure out what's in it. Doing this one hand sucks. <laughs> okay, you get two discs for it. Um, you just listen to them, whatever you want. Uh, here are the list of songs we have. Corde Mal Diablo, Come for Diamond, Medley Main Theme, Map Theme, Grim Resolve, Lanes Theme, and then uh, Cornea Melody, Stage Theme, Battle Theme, and just so on and so on. Basic stuff. Sadly, Heir to the Dragons, I'm not sure is on here, but that's fine. You know, we don't need everything on here. It might, it might be on, uh, might be on the Dragonhold me Melody. I don't see Heir to the Dragons on here at all, so who fucking knows? After that, we have the art book, uh, which I'm gonna save for later. And then we have the Unicorn Overlord card game. Now, originally I was going to, uh, try and play two games of this before this video. My person I was gonna play it with was not able to play it with me. I have no idea uh, how to play this, but from what I got, it's basically Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Go Fish. What are you doing? What I want to actually look at right now is the art book. The art book has a bit of information in it that I actually really like finding. Nothing over here, right? You have all your basic units and whatnot throughout the game. You have your mercenary units. Right, it isn't until, like, uh, we get the concept art, which I think I just skipped on accident. Here's a look at the food. The food's really good. I fucking love the pizza. Fuck yeah, pizza man. This is just gonna take me a minute. I think I skipped it. 
Here we go, found it. Alright, found it. As you see here, here is the page for concept art. We have our bow and arrows and whatnot. But then we get uh we get uh, some interesting uh cut content. There is going to be a brawler unit. Over here we have more uh witch units, as they're not just the same. They might be the same units, who knows? We have some unique units over here. Yeah, we have um I think this is like a male healer unit, mainly because I don't think it's the same unit as the uh is the wizard. Over here though, we have some more inf uh interesting information where we have a dancer unit. So there's apparently gonna be dancers in this game. Then there are also musician units over here which is very interesting to note because those like i said those don't appear in the main game and then down here we have musketeer units so yeah like the main game didn't have any guns because you know it's a medieval fire emblem like game and then over here i think it's just a lot of basic stuff we already we've already seen uh here's a more uh detailed baltro so maybe like maybe there's gonna be like a playable necromancer unit looking at this unit i can't really tell if that's a hammer or whatnot but i think it's a hammer unit i don't know he's really a cinder block there's a king unit which might have been for uh for Gillian, I think his name was. Werewolves. Yeah, all the furries are over here. We have serpents. Uh, serpents were not in the main game. They just have wyverns and uh, griffins. But, you know, serpents were planned at some point. And then we have a shield unit with a, with a trident. I don't think that was in the main game. Over here, we have a bunch of concept art for different locations. Overall, I think most of these made it in. I think there were probably a few that didn't make it in. Basically, the art book. The art book is basically, like I said, just character units, mercenary units, and the locations and food. It's the basic stuff, basic stuff. But, uh, yeah, no. I figured I just wanted to touch on the, uh, cut content that was shown in the concept art. That is the Unicorn Overlord art book. This is still one of the best boxes I've ever had for a video game. This game is magical. This game takes the best aspect from Fire Emblem, Tactics Ogre, and the entire strategy RPG genre. It doesn't feel like a cheap imitation of anything or something extremely basic. It's incredible and one of the best games I've played in 2024. Which doesn't sound like an accomplishment when this is the only new game I've played in 2024. While the story could have had more interesting parts to it, it's the gameplay that matters and, it, and the game does it extremely well. The gameplay here is also really good but also really refreshing compared to other strategy RPGs that I've played, with it having some of the most unique strategic combat that I've seen in my life. Getting to explore a real world where you can actually interact with it is really cool and something I'd love to see other strategy RPGs try one day. I know too much of anything is never a good thing, but... I honestly hope we get to see DLC for this, since I think there's a good amount of potential. Ship the cast or just the core character to a new land, offer a new enemy, offer new classes, and call it a day. And before I forget, I want to mention how gorgeous this game is, as with any vanillaware game. The characters look so good and the backgrounds are just... I have no words to describe them. So, good news. I just got off the phone with the police, looks like I'm free to go. Turns out, I was already supposed to leave jail. That's good, but they also mentioned... House arrest? That's amazing! I can play so many games, fish my backlog, and make. I'm going to miss the launch of Endless Ocean Luminous. <gasps> F Matthew is out of here! <laughs>